Hi, welcome back everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Josh Kelly, today. Josh Kelly is Materials Management Section Chief at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Together, he and a team of six staff work to implement Vermont's waste reduction, recycling, composting, and product stewardship programs and initiatives. Previously, Kelly has worked for the I Institute of- I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Josh Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> um, back to previously, Josh Kelly has worked for the Institute for Sustainable Communities, helping build the capacity of communities to tackle the climate crisis. He has worked to build community composting programs across Vermont with Highfield Center for Composting, and he has spent seven years of conserving forests, farms, lakes, and streams in northern New England with the Trust for Public Land. Kelly has a BS in Environmental Studies and Biology from St. Lawrence University. Josh Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, can you hear me all right? Well, yes, let, let me know if you can. Great, great. <clears throat> um, well, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure to be with you all today. Um, Again, my name is Josh, uh, Josh Kelly, and I work for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, I'm going to share my screen, get my slides up here, and dive right in. All right. Um, technically, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation is within the Agency of Natural Resources. Let me see if I can get this to load. There we go. Um, it would take me a long time to explain all the layers of state government, but essentially um, there's the Agency of Natural Resources. Within that, there's Forest Parks and Rec, Fish and Wildlife that you know, and Department of Environmental Conservation. And within that, I'm within the Solid Waste Program. So I'm going to be talking to you today about solid waste um, and, and a wasteful world. I want to uh, thank the organizers of this event and thank Carolyn and the IT staff at Vermont Law School. And I think there's also some, um, some folks from your local cable access channel that are helping today, so thank you. Um, I love the title, uh, The World of Waste in a Wasteful World. And um, it's exciting for me to, to talk to students um, about what I do and what we do here in the state of Vermont to address waste. Um, in fact, some of the Vermont, Les, Vermont Law School, School graduates have um, been in touch with me and Kathy Jamison, our solid waste program manager, and have done some research and, and tried to help move the needle on uh, Vermont's food waste ban and, um, and other waste initiatives. So it's just really great to connect with you all. Um, so let's get started. Um, actually, let me go back. So these symbols on the right-hand side, you're probably familiar with at least the chasing arrows recycling symbol. Um, Vermont launched these symbols really borrowing from what was already made um, in an effort to try and, you know, lead us all to the, the waste system of the future, which we all know recycling is here, and that's not necessarily the future, that's the present. Um, but food scraps is something that's new, and getting organic materials out of the waste stream is a priority for us in the state, and you're going to hear why soon. And then the trash can, we still need trash, uh, we still need ways to manage solid waste that is trash. And um, we're working on that, but in the, in the meantime, we'll be talking about how our trash is managed as well. So these symbols were copied from West Coast cities like uh, San Francisco and Seattle that were very progressive in their policies around organic waste. These colors are synonymous with the colors they were using. And our hope is that these symbols become just ubiquitous across the globe, um, just as the recycling symbol is today and the general color blue is for recycling. Um, so that those are open source, anyone can use them. And on the left side of at least my screen is a compost bucket that, uh, for food scraps that's collected at a home um, in the central Vermont area by Earth Girl Composting. So I just find that kind of a neat little um, change that has happened in our lives um, recently. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about waste context. I'm gonna try and put it in context for you. I'm gonna go into the history of waste in Vermont, at least skimming the surface of that, and then talk about waste policies that are, set, uh, that are, that are there to address waste issues. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about climate change and a bit about equity and environmental justice. I will be fully upfront that I am not an expert in CERCLA or systemic racism. Um, nor equity and environmental justice, but I, I've taken a stab at some research and how it, how it connects to waste um, 
and in our lives. This photograph is Vermont's uh, Coventry, landfill in Coventry, the one large operating landfill um, called News VT. And um, you can see uh, what we manage as trash and how, um, how much of it we produce. But let's jump right in. And Carolyn and Aiden, at any time, if you can't hear me, um, please speak up uh, or have somebody give me a heads up because I can't see the chat. All right, let's start with the waste context. So I'm using, I'm recycling the landfill slide here for a second to really represent waste. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing essentially what is a grocery store aisle. And the purpose of this slide is to gain an understanding that anything we consume has a potential to become waste and often does um, become waste or it needs to be recycled. And um, the, the thing, if we're really going to tackle waste, we have to consider consumption. We cannot um, just look at waste and ignore consumption. And there's some examples of how um, how how that is difficult for us in our society that I'll that I'll be getting into, but essentially everything we buy, everything we consume, from food to toothpaste to um, to light bulbs um, to carpet, is part of the eventually part of the waste stream. Um, you can actually see some carpet here in this image. And as waste managers, they really um, are just expected to accept and manage whatever they're given. Um, they really, that's really the design of the job is to sort of take what you're given, which is very difficult when anything we might buy um, in the myriad of materials out there becomes a waste product that then can have impacts from toxicity to tonnage, and we'll get into that in some detail. So this is just an example um, to make the point that the things we consume eventually become waste and then have impacts on the waste stream, but I want to point out that it has impacts much higher up in our in our daily lives. So this, <clears throat> this is data about PFAS, an emerging contaminant and toxic chemical that is highly um, used in textiles, as you can see by this graph that is charting the samples of PFAS from different materials in the News VT waste stream. So this is the Coventry the landfill in Coventry, waste that goes into that landfill and how much PFAS is on different types of waste. And you can see that bulky items like sofas and armchairs, textiles, um, carpet, um, and bulky items would also be like mattresses, um, have the highest levels of PFAS in them. And while this is a concern absolutely from a waste angle, it's also a concern uh, because we all are living on these things. We're wearing the clothes, we're sleeping on these, these beds, we're rolling uh, on the carpet and and relaxing you know, um, on these couches. And so we really need to think holistically about how are we gonna manage these materials and what chemicals are we gonna accept into our daily lives before it even ever becomes a waste. It, to tackle it on the waste end is really difficult. To get, to get at it at the front end is the, is the ideal, I think, for us as a society. All right, so let's do a brief history of Vermont waste. This next slide is showing the towns across Vermont, and it's kind of a rainbow of colors. Um, and these are the towns that are either within a solid waste district, they've, they've banded together to join a solid waste district, or they're an independent town, some of the yellow towns, or they're a group of towns um, that regionally have solid waste plans for the management of their solid waste. Um, but even before I get into that history, let's talk about what Vermont used to look like. Um, there was a Don't Burn Vermont campaign. We still have some of the paraphernalia of that around the, the office here. Um, and it dates back to the, the 60s and 70s when a lot of us had, uh, communities had burn barrels in their um, backyards. I know my grandfather did, and that's how he handled his trash. Not only did he use some sticks from the yard in there, but he burned his newspapers and, and um, you know, deli wrap and all kinds of packaging. Um, as we have come along in society, we've changed from more paper and cloth materials to um, much more plastics. And obviously when you burn trash, um, you're releasing a lot of toxins into the air. So there was a move to stop um, burning garbage in the 60s and 70s. One of the things I find ironic about how we as a society manage trash 
is essentially what we do today is we landfill it, which is essentially burying it, or we burn it in incinerators. But if you or I were to do that in our own backyards, that's illegal. We cannot, we're no longer allowed to burn um, uh, solid waste in our backyards, nor are we allowed to bury it there. But that's the best solutions we have come up with for managing the stuff we can't recycle or can't find a better use for. Um, so I just put that into context so that we think critically about what are we going to do with these things we no longer have uses for. Um, and then it, it, with that in mind, with the fact that we, we um, had um, burning going on and we also had unregulated landfilling going on, just about each one of these towns had a landfill or a dump at one time. Some of them were burning at, at those sites too. Um, Act 78 came in um, in the 1980s, the late 80s, early 90s, which ushered in the sanitary landfill era, which required landfills to be lined. And the reason why is simple. We know that garbage and, um, and waste have toxins in them that can leach into groundwater, impacting um, groundwater and potentially even surface waters. And so we, we know that sanitary landfills are necessary to capture those um, any liquids and any toxins before they leach out. Um, sanitary landfills of today have two liners, and we'll have some pictures of that. Um, they actually have three. They have one on the very bottom, and then a sand layer with um, pipe in it so they can sample that layer. Then another layer for the bottom of the landfill. So there's a double lining on the bottom. Then they fill it and they cap it with another layer of plastic, usually plastic tarp type material on top or a clay-based hydrophobic um, kind of clay layer. And um, that's what's used to prevent water from getting in um, and to keep what's in there in there so it doesn't get out. Um, so 1987 is when the sanitary landfill era came in and a lot of the town dumps as a result began to close because of the high cost of becoming a sanitary landfill. In addition, um, operating a landfill today is very expensive. Um, and it's hard to compete to get material. You have to ensure that you're going to have material coming to your landfill. Um, and the private sector has really um, started to serve the bulk of the landfilling needs in Vermont, the Coventry landfill, uh, the landfill in Coventry, News VT is owned by Casella Waste Management. Um, and it's the only operating landfill currently in the state. So many of the unlined town dumps closed since the 19, late 1980s till today. Um, and this also ushered in the time of solid waste planning. It required every town to come up with a solid waste plan for originally where they're gonna, where they're gonna you know, manage their trash and how are they going to reduce um, the dependence on landfilling our waste. Really, what are they going to do to increase recycling, increase reuse, reduce the toxicity of our waste? Um, and so that's why towns started to band together on this regional basis. As folks know, we don't have county government um, in a strong way in, in New England states. And so what we have um, are town governments that act on a quasi-county level. And you can kind of see that from, from this map. It's very similar to some of our regional planning um, maps as well. Um, so that's just a bit of the history of where we've been. Um, and if you want to find what town or solid waste district you're within, uh, check out 802 Recycles and you can find local information on um, how to recycle and how to reuse a number of things. What those town plans have become um, in now today is less so about where are they siting landfills and more about um, diverting and reducing waste. And so that's what the state solid waste plan is aimed at. Again, reducing our dependence on landfills and the town and uh, solid waste district plans are very similar in that way. We're trying to get education out there and services to reduce waste. And you'll see some of that when we get to the policy side. OK, so I promised a picture of a landfill. And this is, again, the News VT landfill in Coventry. This is the liner going down on a new cell. And just to put it into scale, you can see some pickup trucks up on the ridge there um, to the right. Um, that's how, I guess that helps you kind of realize how deep that, that cell is. They call it a cell. Um, that's one of the lining systems on the bottom of the landfill where leachate is collected. Um, and the landfills also put in piping for gas collection. Um, trash, garbage, and other organic material when it breaks down creates methane gas. 
And this landfill does have methane recovery and engines, which are operated by Washington Electric Co-op, and they burn that methane and create electricity, which is excellent. Um, however, even the best design landfills don't capture all of the methane. Um, for one, the landfill is not capped until usually many months after the cell is built because it takes time to fill it up. Um, so they try to capture methane as best they can, but we know from the EPA's data that um, landfill methane still leaches out. Um, and uh, we'll have some data on that when we get to the climate change part. So let's keep going on, on waste context and history of waste. So this is where waste in Vermont goes um, so that you all get a feel for it. And you can see some goes to New Hampshire, some to New York, a very tiny amount to Massachusetts, but most of it is managed here in Vermont um, and really at that landfill in Coventry. Um, roughly, uh, if you do the math here, it's almost 80%, um, depends on the year, but as you can see, the year fluctuates, but um, about 80% is managed in state and about 20% then goes out of state. Um, you can see also that from 2014 to 2016, we were reducing waste. We were reducing how much we were throwing away. And then as the economy improved around 2016, it's been creeping back up. We do tend to see that in, in positive economic um, times, our waste goes up. And when the economy goes down, uh, our waste goes down. Um, so it does tend to track. Let's look a little bit more at what's in our waste stream just for the basis. So I was showing you pictures of what we throw away. The pie chart in figure one on the left is showing you what we divert and dispose. So of the, it's basically a pie chart of all the waste that we generate. And if you think about it, that your empty milk jug is part of the waste stream. When you recycle it, it becomes part of the diversion stream. It's diverted from disposal. So that's why we use that industry term diversion. Um, and so loosely, I call the orange part of the figure one pie, the recycling rate. How much of our materials are we reusing, recycling, composting, donating, that sort of thing. And you can see here in this 2018 data, it was about 31%. Now we have had a goal for more than a decade, almost, I think more than two decades now, of reaching a 50% recycling and composting rate. And we still are not reaching it. Um, we, are, we are hovering around 30 to 36%. Um, and it does fluctuate, um, but you can see we about seven, 69, 70% of our waste is still being disposed. And 30%, in this case, 31% is being recycled or composted. Um, we don't get data on everything that gets recycled. Like if you, give your brother-in-law um, a, a shirt. We don't, aren't, we, that data never comes to us as reuse, um, but we do get recycling reports from recycling facilities. And like, for example, the Vermont Food Bank does provide us with voluntary data on food rescue and food donation. So now let's look at that blue part, that 69% of the waste stream, and, and then shift over to the pie and figure two. And Carolyn, if you could speak up and just let me know if you're still hearing me okay, that would be great. So that blue part of the pie in figure one moves over to the full pie on figure two. Now we're looking at what's in the trash. And, and as you can see about 90% is what's called municipal solid waste. And the other 9% are other wastes. Um, MSW, municipal solid waste does not mean just town trash or municipal trash. What it, it's an industry term that basically means your basic garbage and trash that people produce from households, from basic businesses, but it doesn't include like industrial waste, like mining. It doesn't include contaminated soils. Um, there's not, there's some construction demolition to be in there, but for the most part, we put it in the other category. It also doesn't include septage and sludge coming from wastewater treatment facilities and septic tanks. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of the breakdown, but you can see what parts of that waste stream are there. All right. Now let's get into some of the waste policies that we use to try and address our, our issues in our waste stream. So most states in their solid waste programs focus on waste from two, two main directions, tonnage and toxicity. Remember that pie chart we just showed you of what's in the waste stream? Well, now I'm showing it as a stacked bar graph. And in this bar, you're seeing what is in the trash by material type. Now, there's some things in here, this is by weight, 
So there's some things that are significant um, in their tonnage. And then there's some things that are significant in their toxicity. You see hazardous and electronic waste at the top, that 1.1%. Um, those are concerning um, um, items in the waste stream that we want to focus on. So most states regulate waste by focusing on toxicity and or focusing on large tonnage things in the waste stream that don't really need to be there. Notice the food waste at the bottom is about 19% of what's in the waste stream. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but let's focus on toxicity first. Okay, so one policy that was put in place in the early 2000s um, was the Vermont reduction uh, campaign, which a mercury reduction campaign, which was focused on one of the most toxic element and, and uh, chemicals out there, which is mercury. It's pervasive, it's a heavy metal. It takes very small amounts to be toxic in the, um, the food chain and in people. And it bio magnifies in the food chain such that once you, you catch certain fish, remember those fish advisories, like not to eat too much swordfish or, or don't eat um, you know, certain lake trout salmon in large quantities because the mercury bioaccumulates in the system. Um, mercury can be deposited through the air um, when waste is incinerated, and it, um, it, can, be, it can get into the, the water bodies in other ways when waste is not managed well. So this is mercury, therm uh, mercury thermostats in the bottom and mercury light bulbs, which now have um, a take back program where the manufacturers of these products pay for the collection and recycling of them. And if you don't know about it, you will by the end of this presentation. I just wanna point out the linear uh, fluorescent bulbs, the tubes on the right. Notice the HG circle symbol. That is a, the elemental mercury symbol. And it's trying to educate you as a consumer or as a resident that that is um, containing mercury and that that lamp needs to be safely managed. We have seen people smash these bulbs because they explode in a very cool way, but they are releasing mercury when they do that. And it is very dangerous to them and the community that, that they are around when they when they break them. So we have a program for recycling those um, in, across the state. And it's one of the reasons um, this is focused on is because it's a toxic, again, toxic part of the waste stream. So that's the reason for focusing there. I'm back to PFAS again. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is an emerging uh, contaminant of concern in waste. And so you saw um, recently the legislature and the governor signed a law that essentially bans PFAS chemicals in firefighting foam, food packaging, um, in stain resistant treatments. So remember those some of those textiles we talked about. Um, so this is a reaction to these emerging contaminants and they're trying to go upstream to deal with them, um, which is really the most effective way to, to stop them coming into our, our waste system. I mentioned to you these take back programs and here you can see um, the, the five free recycling programs that are offered in the state. These are covered by the manufacturers of these products and they're focused on because they have an impact on waste, often from a toxicity um, level, even though they may not be a significant portion of the waste, waste stream by tonnage, in, they are toxic even in small amounts. So the thermostat program, you can get $5 back at, um, as a rebate at most of your hardware stores um, that operate that program. The paint care program is to try and recycle and safely manage paint and not have that in the waste stream. We have batteries, um, rechargeable and single use batteries that can be recycled around the state. Our Vermont electronics program covers computers, monitors, televisions, and printers. Um, and again, mercury, uh, mercury containing bulbs, which are the fluorescent tubes and the compact fluorescence. Um, so this is just an example of what, what's called product stewardship or extended producer responsibility programs to address um, toxicity and waste. All right, now let's go to tonnage. So another uh, product stewardship program that addresses beverage containers is the bottle bill, which dates back to the 70s and was really a, a litter control law, um, but is now part of the recycling system we know and love today. Um, it is both um, addressing tonnage and it's a form of product stewardship. Essentially, beverage manufacturers that have covered, that make covered beverages, keep in mind apple cider that becomes hard cider is not covered in the program, but beer um, is. So beer cans and beer bottles must carry the deposit and it is charged to you and me when we purchase those items. And then we get the nickel back 
when we redeem the empty beverage container. So that's a form of product stewardship where the manufacturer has a role in, in taking back the material. Um, and it's, it's been around since the 70s and still operating today. In 2012, looking at tonnage, and we'll get at the, the pie chart in a second here, um, the Vermont Universal Recycling Law was passed, Act 148, and it passed unanimously. And it really was focused on two parts of the waste stream that make up a significant amount of the tonnage that don't really need to be in the waste stream. And that's organic materials that could be composted, et cetera, and recyclable materials. So this is a pie chart, again, of what's in the waste stream. And again, it's showing a lot of material that is organic, that is metal, glass, plastic, and paper. And so because some of that paper, some of that plastic, and some of that organic material and metal and glass can be recycled, that was why the universal recycling law was put forth because we know almost as much as 50% of our trash could be recycled, donated, or composted. And food waste is the single largest portion by material type of our waste stream. Now you're gonna look at special waste and say that's 26%. Remember special waste makes up a whole host of categories like bulky waste, carpet, textiles, rubber. Um, it's not just one category, even though it's shown here lumped. So in the organics portion at the bottom, 20% of that approximately is food waste. And it's the single largest component of our waste stream. About half comes from residential here and half from commercial. And that, that rate of about 20% of our waste stream is similar with what the US EPA's data is for uh, Americans across the country. Um, so it's significant. And we've calculated that if we compost Vermont's food waste instead of um, landfilling it, it has a huge greenhouse gas uh, impact by reducing emissions as much as taking over 9,500 vehicles off the road each year. Um, and we'll talk more about the climate change impacts of that soon coming up. So let's dig into a little bit more of Vermont's universal recycling law. It essentially tried to do two things, incent create incentives and create convenience. Some of the, the major portions of the incentives are to ban materials from being disposed which incentivizes businesses and, and, um, and operations that want to take material and reuse it. So, um, you know, composting sites, as I mentioned, anaerobic digesters, animal feed operations for food scraps, um, incentivizing food donation and food rescue, um, increasing recycling. Um, when something is banned, you know the material is going to be there so you can invest in the infrastructure. Um, it also put in place what's called unit-based pricing, or some people call it pay-as-you-throw. It, it essentially is requiring that anyone in the state who has trash services must uh, price those based on volume or weight. In some communities around the country, um, Americans sometimes pay for their waste through their property taxes, so they're not actually paying per gallon or per bag or per kilowatt hour, like we do gas or water or electricity, right? So if I use 12 bags of trash a week and I put those out on the curb and you only put out two, well, you're subsidizing my waste habits and that's really not fair. Um, this is about equity and it's also shown to be one of the single most um, quick, quickest drivers of change in terms of getting people to recycle and, and reduce their waste and, and compost their food scraps, et cetera. It also required haulers and um, haulers to bundle the cost of trash with the cost of recycling. And that was so that people would not opt out of recycling when they saw it as a separate line item on their bill. So now it has to be one cost because we know if you produce trash um, and you put trash out on the curbside, you also produce recycling. And then the convenience standards, which was unique to Vermont's law, required anyone who offers trash collection, either a transfer station or a hauler, needed to uh, offer mandated recycling um, collection, and in some cases, leaf and yard debris, and in some cases, food scrap collection. The facilities were required to do leaf and yard debris collection. Haulers were, were originally required to do that, but it got repealed, so they're not required to offer leaf and yard debris collection, for the most part, because people don't um, manage leaf and yard debris in their trash. They're mainly managing it in their backyard or at a drop-off. 
Um, and then public space recycling required that anywhere in a, a school or a town office or a park, uh, a, a city park or in um, an airport, that there's a, if there's a trash can, there must be a recycling bin next to it. Okay, let's dig into the food waste part of the law just for a little bit more detail. Just wanted to note that Vermont is one of eight states with food waste bans, including California, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and now Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. And we, <clears throat> we actually copied Connecticut with our law where it basically, I call it, I'm gonna age myself here, but it, I call it the field of dreams model. And if you haven't seen that ancient movie, um, it's a movie where this man hears, Kevin Costner hears this, this, this voice in his head that if he builds a baseball field in his cornfield, these, um, these dead uh, you know, uh, baseball players like Babe Ruth will come so if you build it, they will come is the field of dreams. And um, that's essentially what a lot of the policies are in the Northeast. They say, if you produce a certain amount of food scraps per week, and there's a certified facility that's able to take it within a certain distance, you must separate that material. And what that does is it incentivizes, it, you know, what I call organics entrepreneurs to build facilities because they know there's going to be material available. So we've seen composting facilities open up. We've seen anaerobic digesters open up and we've seen hauling services open up. Um, we'll get to some of that. So the law just went a little bit further in Vermont than in these other states, like in Connecticut, it stopped at one ton and in Vermont, it kept going until eventually in 2020, all food waste was banned and is banned from disposal. There are a few exceptions, like at home, if you compost at home, you can throw away meat and bones. That is not subject to the law if you're a homeowner that composts in your at home, partly because composting meat and bones is difficult at home. And then trash facilities, remember that convenience? Um, and haulers were required to offer food scrap collection. Haulers are only required to offer it if there's not essentially another hauler that offers it. And you'll see how that has changed over the recent years. Lastly, Vermont has adopted a food recovery hierarchy that really prioritizes source reduction first that's really eating what you buy. Um, food for people, remember food donation I was talking about before, food for animals, composting and anaerobic digestion. And the energy recovery part is really uh, applicable to our leaf and yard debris and clean wood ban, which also uses this hierarchy. But essentially this is the priority system the state's using to encourage people when they have wasted materials to, to follow this hierarchy. And let's talk a little bit about the results. So we know from our data that there are hundreds and probably now thousands of businesses across the state and institutions that are separating their food scraps. Um, residents are composting. Our 2018 data, which is the last time we, we did a survey, showed that 40% of residential food waste is being separated from the garbage right now. A lot of that is home composting, but some of that is through curbside haulers and at drop-offs. Um, in the beginning of the law's rollout, food donation nearly tripled, according to the Vermont Food Bank. Um, it really incentivized some of the major grocery chains to get better at food rescue. Um, and the number of food scrap haulers since 2012, when the law was passed, has more than tripled. We're at about 45 haulers right now. And each year since 2016, food waste collection has grown at our facilities and uh, around the region. Here's another version of demonstrating the growth in services. So this map is, these two maps are showing commercial food scrap collection services from 2018 to 2019, really just a year's time. And as we're getting closer to the food waste ban in 2020, you can see these orange areas, which represent towns that haulers are servicing. You can see it growing over time, um, quite remarkably actually. And so, um, you also can see the facilities, which are represented by the Apple cores on the left um, in 2018, and we changed to a numbered system in 2019 so that we could identify the facilities for people. Um, we have quite a regional uh, array of facilities around the state, most of which are composting facilities. There's a few digesters and some organics transfer stations in there. Um, but there's even more than this if you include the farm-based composters, which there's a number of those as well in the state. So it's quite remarkable the growth we've seen in services to respond to this, uh, this implementation of a food waste ban in Vermont. 
And some of our municipalities have the best data we found on the impact of the 2020 food waste ban. This is from the Addison County Solid Waste District at their transfer station. And just look at 2017, the amount of food waste they were taking in. And as it just ticks forward, 2018, 2019, and 2020, some of our facilities more than doubled. Many of them were at the doubling point from before July 1, 2020 to after. We also at DEC launched a food scrap waste, scrap food waste campaign. Um, and you can check that out. There's a great video there. We're really trying to get at two things. We're trying to value our food so we don't waste it in the first place by saying in simple language, eat what you buy and compost the scraps. We know that everybody produces some coffee grounds or banana peels that they can't eat. And so we want people to, to put those in the right place because it really, really matters. And we'll talk about that at the climate change portion. All right, I'd be remiss if I didn't just at least touch on recycling challenges. Some of you may be skeptical of where your recyclables go. You know, you've heard that China maybe has stopped accepting things and things aren't being recycled. Let me just say right here clearly that in general in Vermont, that is not the case. In general, Vermonters are excellent at recycling. In general, our recycling system, it has a high level of integrity and they are, um, bailing your materials every each and every day and sending them to market. You can see on the right, this is the Williston Murph, um, where I believe it's the Williston Murph, it might be the Rutland Murph, where there's cardboard and paper and containers mixed together. And then on the left, these are the cans that have been sorted out. Um, some of these are beer cans, some of these are, are seltzer cans, all different types of aluminum, um, you know, pet food aluminum cans are in here as well. And those are going to market again, like I said, every single week of every single year. But when China began what they call their national sword, which was an initiative to clean up the, the, the country's wastes um, and manufacturing systems that relied on recyclable materials, it really sent a shockwave through the system. China is a major consumer of goods and really recycled materials are global commodities. So paper, plastics, metal um, are all global commodities that travel around the globe and China was a huge importer of these and they were also getting some trash in with it and so contamination and wish cycling as you can see in the cloud on the left was part of the problem here we were not in the United States generally um, recycling as well as we could and it's tough because products and packaging the designers are not recyclers so they're putting out packaging constantly which is really confusing for us as of the recycling community. So I don't really blame people. They wanna do the right thing, but with the packaging changing constantly and some things having chasing arrows on it, it's really hard to keep up with it. So if people feel fatigued from mixed messages. There's also packaging changes. There's multiple layer packaging. The materials also were losing value globally um, and the volume was really high, but there was not as much of a market as the market fluctuated when China stopped accepting things. The silver lining though is that we have, as a nation and even in Vermont, have prioritized ways of, of communicating what's recyclable in ever more simple and clear ways. But in the, in the short term, there was an increased cost to recycle, um, which is starting to abate now as markets are now turning around. I wanna pause here just for a moment and say, why does it cost money to recycle? First of all, you saw those piles of material and then you saw the bales. And before you can get to the bale, you might think that machines are doing this separation, which they are doing some of it, but on it, actually there are people hand picking the recycling in Vermont each and every day. Uh, it's a very difficult job. It's a very dirty job, noisy. Um, if you get a chance to tour or virtually tour a MRF, I highly recommend it. And then look at this pie chart of what's in the recycling stream. This is from Chittenden Solid Waste District's MRF in Williston. Um, notice that paper, mixed paper and cardboard, the two blue colors here are, you know, easily almost 70% or more of the pie. Um, and if you don't have a good market for mixed paper, which when China launched its initiative, it was really stopping imports of mixed paper and many plastics, um, that really, really impacted global markets. So even though Vermont wasn't sending a lot of materials to China, actually we're sending very few, if any, um, most of Vermont's recyclables stay domestically and, and to this day still do. Um, it impacted the, the amount of money that, that, the, that the MRFs, the material recovery facilities were making. 
And so they really had a lot of, they have a lot of cost just to sort these things and sell them. Um, and the sale price does not typically cover the cost to sort and bale materials. And that is a myth that people have that recycling should be free when it's really not. One other thing here, the landfill trash portion, 7%. We call that contamination and recycling. Remember the wish cycling I was talking about? This is a remarkable number when you look at national data. Many states and municipalities across the US have upwards of 15, 25% contamination. Vermont hovers around 10% or maybe less as this shows a 7%. And this to me tells me that Vermonters are excellent at recycling in general. Um, and that's the take home message. We do it really well here, but we have to keep doing it well if we're gonna keep our recycling system intact. We launched a Recycle Like You Live Here initiative to help with this um, misinformation around what to recycle and what not to recycle. We were really targeting things like, you know, food waste in the recycling system or batteries, which are cause fires. Um, or tanglers like Christmas lights and plastic bags, which are one of the biggest problems. Do not put your recyclables in plastic bags. Keep them loose. Um, send them to, the, to your recycling facility without the bag, please. It's a constant issue for recyclers. All right, let's take a little pause and shift to the ocean plastics issue, which I know is a major concern for all of you. So just doing a quick online search of plastic waste, you get this type of stuff. And it's very concerning to us, and it was concerning to the legislature. You notice the turtle that was sort of seen around the world that really drove um, essentially what has been called um, that plastics have lost their social license. That somebody said that at a conference where, that I was at, and I've used it ever since because people really have turned on plastics in a major way. And in response, Vermont passed Vermont's single use products law, which essentially prohibits, these are not landfill bans, these are prohibitions on giving out or selling these products. So in Vermont, as a store or retailer or restaurant, you cannot provide um, plastic stir sticks or polystyrene food and beverage containers. As a supermarket, you can't use plastic bags for customers anymore, and you can only provide straws upon demand. Um, and if you give out any bag, you can use paper bags, but you must charge 10 cents for them. So this was really aimed at reducing single-use products in reaction to, um, to the, the ocean plastics issue and other concerns about single-use products and their impact on the waste stream. Remember I talked about tonnage and toxicity. This one kind of fits in that amb ambiguous area. It's not These materials right here in front of us are not significant from their tonnage aspect, nor are they very toxic, but polystyrene, expanded polystyrene does have impacts. And we know that when these um, materials don't get managed well, when they get tossed on the roadside as litter, all of us love green up day, these things don't break down and they become issues for fish, for wildlife, um, and they're unsightly and they contribute to litter. So that's why they've gotten this, um, this focus. We helped uh, launch this law with um, the Bring your, bring your own bag campaign. And if you haven't already, just remember when you leave the house, grab a bag. I don't, I don't care if you're going to get takeout or if you're going to the farmer's market um, or if you're going clothes shopping, grab a bag. It's so easy to do. You just got to get in the habit. And, and also bring your own water bottle, your own coffee mug. Um, it's really important that we all do our part to just reduce waste from even being produced. Let's put it in a little bit more context. Remember those pie charts about our waste stream? This is another version of that. And it's really trying to analyze how much of the waste stream is single use products in general. So some of this is polystyrene. Some of this is, you know, a tin can that we use once. Um, some of this is plastic wrap or plastic packaging. Notice that about 32% we estimate from our studies of the waste stream is single use products and items. So anything you can do to reduce that is going to have a pretty big impact on tonnage, and it has the potential to anyway. So while straws don't make up a very large portion of the waste stream, the, single, the general, a lot of single-use products do. And this reminds me of my own house where I use paper towels. I try to use less of them and use um, cloth instead that I can wash and reuse. Um, but it, it's up to all of us to work on this. So let me just recap policies for you, and then we'll start wrapping up and get to your questions. We have 
talked about product bans where we ban the, the, the sale or the giving out of certain products like the single use products law. We've talked about bans on using PFAS in food packaging and firefighting foams. So that's a product ban. We've also talked a little bit about mercury and I didn't get into it in detail, but the mercury laws also had phase outs where they required um, that, that basically manufacturers could not sell mercury thermostats after a certain date. Um, so we really sort of banned this, the giving of them in a phased time frame. Then product stewardship laws, remember those five extended producer responsibility laws for mercury bulbs, thermostats, electronics, paint, and batteries. Those are all examples of where a producer of a product takes some responsibility for the end of life management of that material. Um, and then we have disposal bans where we, where we landfill ban or um, uh, prohibit the, the putting in the trash of recyclables, leaf and yard debris. That's through the uh, universal recycling law, and which included eventually food scraps. Um, and then there's incentives such as pay as you throw that help drive people to do uh, the right thing. Lastly, there's convenience standards. Remember the universal recycling law was, was built to make it as easy to recycle or compost something as it is to throw it away. So when you go to the transfer station with your bag of trash, they now have recycling available to you, they're required to, and they have food scrap collection too. Um, and then extent, the EPR laws above have certain convenience standards so that even if you're in, let's say the Northeast Kingdom, you can recycle paint up there um, at multiple locations. All right, I'm almost done. I'm gonna hit climate change, consumption and waste. And I remember that part about consumption. We're gonna talk about that and then I'm gonna to get to equity. So. There's so much doom and gloom around climate change that I like to try and think positive about what we can do about it. And this book was groundbreaking. It's called Project Drawdown. There's a hundred um, solutions that are some of the most comprehensive solutions for uh, addressing climate change. And notably, just to go back to food, number three was reducing food waste in the first place because of the huge amounts of energy and resources that go into our food system. And it's estimated that about 40% of the food that's grown is wasted. It's either wasted in the field, wasted in transit, wasted in manufacturing, wasted in the restaurant, wasted in your refrigerator. So putting a little area of your fridge with an eat these first um, really helps you manage your leftovers and use up the food before it goes bad. I do that in my household and it's definitely saving me money. It's estimated the average family wastes $1,500 every year on food that they buy and never eat. So I'd definitely like to have $1,500 back. Uh, lastly, methane digesters are part of the solution and compost as well. That's the anaerobic digesters and composting we talked about before. So people often say to me, but yeah, but doesn't food waste in the landfill help rot the landfill? Um, and, and isn't it beneficial? And they have landfill gas and that's good. And that's creating heat and power. Um, landfill gas to energy is good. It's something we definitely want. But we have to be clear that landfilling is not an active process. It is more of like a mummification process. It is like wrapping up your waste in a burrito so that it doesn't do anything. And when it's in that burrito, the food waste and other organic materials are starved of oxygen. They're in a trash bag, they're packed down with other waste by those big crawler machines. And then they're sealed like a sarcophagus with a plastic tarp on top. And it promotes anaerobic without oxygen digestion, which creates methane with gas. Methane gas is a super pollutant of climate change. Landfill gas methane is the third largest human produced source of methane in the, in the world. And it's second only to the fossil fuel industry and agriculture. It's anywhere from 20 to 80 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. So if you compost your banana peel today, instead of throwing it in the trash, it has a significant impact on climate change. Look at this data, about 80,000 tons of food waste are thrown away each year from our 2018 study in Vermont. If we were to compost it, it's like dr not driving around the world 4,629 times. Um, so it has a huge difference. And the reason is when you actively compost something, um, even in your backyard, it doesn't produce that methane, um, and, and which is a global climate pollutant. I wanna get back to consumption. And I know this is a detailed pie chart, but for those of you who are thinking about climate change and how much you drive and how much you're heating your home with oil heat and how much that contributes to climate change, 
Notice that buildings and HVAC is down at the bottom as a significant contributor. And then these other ones on the right-hand side of transport, um, obviously big contributors to climate change, but there's something we're not talking about very much. And that's when we buy something on Amazon that was maybe made in China or Indonesia and it comes over here and it's a good that we buy and we're happy we got it, but it has embodied energy in it. It has emissions in it and they are significant. Remember food? Remember how we said food was number three on the drawdown list of food weight solutions to climate change? Look at how many emissions are, are in the provision of food. So what I want you to take home is that we talk about emissions from our waste, but we need to talk about emissions from consumption of goods and services, especially food, and we need to think about reducing those because they are as significant or more so than our heat and power in our buildings or how much we are driving. I'm not saying they're not all important, but we are waking up as a community to look at uh, consumption-based emissions inventories, looking at climate as a whole, as, as the embodied energy it takes to create any product we purchase, wherever it is produced, um, from the US, from our backyard, from, um, from our neighbor, or from across the oceans. So it's important that we keep that in mind when we think about greenhouse gas emissions. All right, lastly, on equity, inclusion, and environmental justice. First, let me just say I'm not an expert in this field, so I'll do my best. Um, I want to acknowledge that I did some research briefly into the history of environmental injustice in landfills and incinerators, and I found a Department of Energy article um, that in 1982, um, there was the proposal of citing a hazardous waste landfill in a predominantly African-American community in North Carolina. And they sort of attributed that as a spark of the environmental justice movement. I acknowledge also that we all create waste. And as such, we have a, a community-wide responsibility for its safe management. One of the four laws of ecology, the second one is everything must go somewhere. Um, and so we have this struggle of if it has to go somewhere, but where? And it, is, it tends to be that things with an environmental impact, whether they're manufacturing um, or whether they're um, uh, landfilling, tend to be in communities that are um, uh, underserved. And, uh, and, and that is a trend we need to think about carefully and need to think about reversing. Um, I wanna also acknowledge that resource extraction, manufacturing pollution, are also environmental injustice, uh, environmental justice issues. And as we reduce the number of goods or that we purchase or make our goods last longer and reuse them and repair them, there's less um, of resources that we need. And if we keep those resources being recycled, there's less impacts from resource extraction and manufacturing pollution. So again, getting back at consumption, we need to keep that in mind all the time. Whenever we're thinking about buying something, we should be thinking, could I repair something I have? Could I get this used? Um, it'll save us money and it will keep materials in the system longer and reduce some of the impacts of that manufacturing consumption emissions um, and pollution process. We've seen how phase outs can help address toxicity and that can help um, you know, communities that have been heavily impacted by toxics in the past. And bans can reduce the the products we we are manufacturing that we really just don't need if we um if we bring our own water bottle we don't need water bottles um and we're trying to, and it can have both positive impacts upstream and downstream from resource extraction and manufacturing pollution to waste disposal so at dec we're we're taking our own approach to addressing some inequities we have not been very good at translating our materials from English, but we're dipping our toe in the water with these, um, not just uh, English translations to Spanish or French, but to Arabic, to Chinese, to we have even one of uh, Vietnamese, and we're getting some responses on this, which is, which is interesting and very uh, hopeful for us and hopeful we can keep doing it. We're just about to do our Waste Not Guide. For those of you that want to check this out, vtrecycles.com is our website. It basically is the one-stop shop of everything from what's banned from the landfill what is a special recycling item that you can take back and who to contact, what websites to visit to find out where to do it. Um, so that's it for me. I wanna say thank you and turn it over to Carolyn for questions. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be with you today and hopefully I didn't take up too much of your time. This is my contact info. And again, these symbols are downloadable for free 
Anyone can use them. They're open source. Have at it. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. That was a wonderful presentation. We have a few questions for you. First, we have, is the paint return program motivated primarily by lead paint or are modern acrylic and oil-based paints also a major source of toxins? For the, oh, that's a great question. Um, it was not motivated by lead paint. Lead paint's been phased out for years. Um, I'm sure there is still some potential for lead paints to be in people's garages or basements. Um, but when I talked about toxicity, I neglected to give credit to Vermont's local governments, those solid waste districts and independent towns. We have some of the highest level of household hazardous waste services in the United States. And we have that because we have prioritized toxicity and household hazardous waste is basically the most common things that you and your mom and dad and your aunts and uncles produce in their daily lives that is hazardous or toxic. There are things like you bought um, a, a pesticide to kill, um, let's say, to kill cockroaches or ants. You bought um, something for your car, some antifreeze thing or something like um, dry gas to put in your gas tank. Or you just didn't, you had used gasoline mixed with oil for a chainsaw and you didn't have any use for it anymore. Um, their paint, their batteries and light bulbs, those are the things that are household hazardous waste that we have collection for in this state because we've prioritized it. Um, we fund it actually out of, uh, there's something called a $6 per ton fee. We call it the franchise fee or franchise tax on every ton of trash that's produced in the state of Vermont. That has a $6 per ton fee. And we use that money to pay for household hazardous waste events around the state. It doesn't cover all the costs, but it covers a, a portion of it. But to get back to the paint question, it was really driven by the industry who was ready to take back their materials. And a lot of that paint, the latex and acrylic gets recycled. Um, the oil base is generally used for fuel. It has a high uh, fuel content, like, like uh, heating oil. Um, and some of the oil base is reblended into paints too. Um, but if you can buy, if, if any of you are painting your apartment or your house, um, check out the local color um, paint that's available at resource locations in Vermont. And uh, Chittenden Solid Waste District is the one that recycles that paint through the paint care program. And it's available around the state and is very affordable and has great coverage. I've used it in my own home. Great. Thank you. Also, uh, you are still sharing your screen. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, so that'd be great. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> our, our next question okay. is, what effects have Vermont's law prohibiting food scraps from trash had on Vermont's solid waste disposal system and landfill emissions, and how is it enforced? Oh, there's a lot packed into that question. Um, so I'll say first, we we don't yet have the data from this year as to what amount of food waste was separated out. That's our tweet. It's actually from 2020. We, um, we get the data in and we, we refine it usually a year after the data comes in because there's a lot of duplicates in the data that we have to work out. Um, so we're not sure yet how much material is uh, anticipated to still be in the waste stream, but um, our best way of measuring that is through our uh, waste composition studies. They're also called waste characterization studies, where we hire a contractor to look through samples of trash and separate it out. That's how we know that there's approximately 19% of our trash is food waste. Um, it's from those studies. We have one study done in 2018. We have another coming up in 2023. So that'll be the best data we'll have on the impact of the food waste ban on our waste stream. On emissions, you know, there are many things that go into a landfill that create uh, methane, and there are some who have been concerned that it will reduce the methane generation. It, I mean, it should, over time, um, reduce it in some way because we're trying to keep food waste out. Um, however, there's still a lot of painted wood, construction demolition material, sludge and septage, which create um, emissions that... Um, that contribute to the gas generation. So I don't generally see that we're going to um, have 
a big falling off. We even did uh, studies uh, looking at that ourselves at the Coventry landfill and, and when um, and if there would be an impact on methane. And partly because that landfill is taking in much more waste than it has in the past because it's the one operating landfill, we don't anticipate that they're going to see less gas than they have at least before the law was passed in 2012 um, uh, because they're taking in more stuff. And, and let's just be clear, just because you have a landfill ban on things doesn't mean that overnight 100% of stuff is out of the waste stream. We have a landfill ban on tires. We have a landfill ban on um, white goods like your washing machine and your stove. In general, those things are kept out of the waste stream, but not 100%. And food waste is the same. When we passed that law, the, the legislature required us to do a study to see what the impacts of that law would be. And the contractor who did the study estimated that at best, we would have about 60% of the food waste in landfills kept out, 60% by about 2022. That was as far out as they went. So that's our estimate of success initially. And how do we enforce the law? Um, we have started with education and outreach because this is a huge amount of change for people. Everybody produces some amount of food waste at some time. And so everybody needs to take action. We essentially um, do education and outreach first, but we also respond to any complaints we get and we do get them. And we do priority outreach to the largest generators like supermarkets, um, hospitals. We've been doing that outreach since um, approximately 2017 and even a little bit before. Um, so that's how we're, we're going about it. So there are enforcement capabilities, but we really prioritize education and outreach first. Thank you. And thank you so much for your presentation today. It was fantastic and we really appreciate it. And we are wrapped up. And I just remind the audience that our next panel starts at 1145. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>